Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening service. Stand with me and sing number 411, Look and Live. Go ahead and get to the message. And uh, today's message, it's a message for the, the little guy or the little woman. Um, not necessarily how big or tall or anything like that you are, but you know what I mean by the little guy, right? Uh, and today's sermon, I, I titled it, What Could a Little What Could Little Old Me Do for Such a Big God? Because God is big. You ever think about how big God is? He's Infinite in power, infinite in size. He, you know, he's, he's just amazing how how God is, and we're made from dirt. God made us though, so, so that's good. But God's big, so what can little old me do? Now I can tell you the truth here. Uh, when I was writing the sermon, the little drummer boy came to mind. I'd love to look for a Bible verse on the little drummer boy. It's not really new. So <laughs> would, would, would it be a great would it be a great passage? I think it would, you know, would be. But we got some other ones that uh, kind of come close that we'll get into. Um, so again, uh, what do you you ever you heard the saying, what do you give a man who has everything? Or what do you give a woman that has everything? Well, a man and a woman, they don't really have everything, but there's some that seem like they almost do. 
especially if you're not as uh, well off as they are financially or whatever like that, or, or a kid trying to buy something uh, for their parent or whatever like that, is like sometimes it gets tough. Is what do you give the man who has everything? What do you give the God who had, literally has everything, who knows all things, has all ability, all powerful? So God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your protection. He doesn't need your knowledge. So you don't, you know, he doesn't come in. He doesn't need to ask us for advice. Um, he has all power, all knowledge, and all abilities. So you can kind of see why the little, we all know the little drummer boy song, I'm sure. Who, who doesn't? And of course, he, he didn't have anything to give. In the song, he didn't have anything to give the baby Jesus. So he did the only thing he could do, the only thing he could think of was playing his drum. So sometimes it might feel that way too for us. And we'll say, what can I possibly do? To serve the Lord, you might say, "I'm not an eloquent speaker," or you know, "I don't have an advanced degree," or "I don't," have, you know, you can give a lot of different reasons and, and make yourself, you know, maybe feel too small to actually do something uh, for the Lord that He might have you to do. Well, we're I'm going to get into four points, and be honest, the fourth point. When I was writing the sermon, I was like, I don't know that this fits in the sermon. But God laid it on my heart to put this fourth point in. And I'm still not sure if it, when I'm reading through the sermon and all, I'm like, does this actually fit? But then I, I'm thinking, well, if God laid it on my heart to do it, I'm putting it in there, and then, uh, then whatever um, happens, happens from that. But there's going to be four points. So before I get to those points, because, you know, we're talking about what could you possibly give a guy who who's, has everything? What could little old me do for service uh, for such a big God? Well, God doesn't want our things. He wants us. God loves you and wants you to love him back. And he wants you to love others, too, because God loves people. It's really natural for us to love those who God loves, and that's all of us. So first, we, we love him. Let, let me uh, read you from um, Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So God loved us first. He directs us to love him. And I like to just put it with everything we have. And when we talk about our heart, you know, we don't just mean the thing pumping in our chest. It means that our core, down deep, the root of us, you know, and all, you see the analogies there, that we to love God with everything we have, and then we love others like we love ourselves. That's the perfect order. God first loved us, he wants us to love him, and he wants us to love others. So we can give to the Lord just by obeying his commandments, and doing those things. So, when it comes to service for the Lord, I don't know anybody without any knowledge or any skills or any abilities where they can't serve the Lord. I don't think anybody fits that bill, or they probably wouldn't be even able to listen to the sermon here right now if they don't have that. But we can do something for the Lord, whether how big or small we are, because we don't compare ourselves to each other. At least we shouldn't compare ourselves to each other. We're supposed to compare ourselves to the standard, and that's Jesus. And it doesn't matter, you know, if you're seven foot tall and somebody's five foot tall, that's nothing when you consider how big God is. And I'm, I'm using height as an analogy, but just in, 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 every, in all things. So four points, I'm gonna start with point number one. Yeah, and and the, if you remember the sermon title, what could little me do for such a big God? Well, point number one is do what you can. Now, I've got a couple things that I'm on point number one, and what are a couple things I'm going to read really fits for all the points in here, but I'm, gonna, I just, I'm just reading it with point number one. So it's not for me to judge what you can do and what you can't do, or what's reasonable for you to do or not do, and neither is it your place to judge me for what I can do and can't do, what I should be doing, what I shouldn't be doing. 
God is a reasonable God. Let me read you this from Romans 12. 1. I find myself in Romans chapter 12 a lot lately, but I, I'll read you this from Romans uh, 12. 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God's a reasonable God. And he allows us to actually reason with him too. And when you reason with God, he'll show you those things. So what's the right amount of service? Or what should your service be to the Lord? Well, that's between you and God. So you give with God, you reason with God, and he'll show you those things. And you'll find peace in those things. So throughout this whole sermon, it's not to look at what you're doing in comparison to anybody else here. It's between you and God what your level of service is. And what God, God might have one person to do might not be nearly the same thing as what he has somebody else to do. And it doesn't matter as long as we're in the will of God for that. And God's the one that, that gives us that desire to serve him and to do those things. So um, all of our knowledge, skills, and abilities are gifts from God in the first place. So one person may seem a lot more talented. Well, what are they going to use with that talent for God? How are they going to use the gift they were given, whether if it looks big or small, whatever that gift may be? Well, in, in the same chapter of Romans, uh, Romans chapter 12, I'll read you just three more verses, 6, 7, and 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophecy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So those gifts that we get from God, we can use to, to serve the Lord. And we're not all given the, the same gift. He uses the analogy of, of, a, of a body. You know, we, we, all the parts in our bodies have different functions, but they're all important to our being. And our ears are important, our eyes are important, our arms are important. So one's not supposed to boast about whatever position that they have in the body. And we make up the body of Christ, and Christ is the head. So we use those gifts. So, like I said before, the little drummer boy isn't in the Bible, but... These, these people are, and I'm just going to read a couple, and uh, I preach on this one relatively recently too, the woman at the well. I, I, I love that passage of scripture about the woman at the well. She, she wasn't an innocent little drummer boy, but she was at the bottom, and she was bottom of a, of a social life. If you know the story, you can read it more in John chapter 4, but uh, when it was all said and done, she got saved. So she had five husbands. She's married. She's living with a guy that's not her husband. She's uh, drawing water from the well all by herself because more than likely the other women, would, you know, she wouldn't be accepted with them. And she's drawing the water at the hottest part of the day. And Jesus comes along and he tells her about him and the salvation that he brings. And she gets saved. And then during this time, the disciples were out getting food. And when they come back, they saw the woman at the, at the woman there with Jesus, and she, and she left, leaving her water pot there. And here, here I'm just going to read a couple verses from there. In John chapter 4, verse 28, The woman then left her water pot and her, went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all the things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And then, in John, and just a little bit further on, the same passage, John chapter 4, verse 39, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him, they believed on Jesus, for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. So, we see a woman of, at the bottom, you know, had plenty of, you know, di different husbands, different stuff. Who else knows what else went on in her life? <laughs> Who would have thought that she could serve the Lord and have a testimony that would bring people to Christ? But she did. She had a great testimony, and all the testimony was, come see the man that told me everything I did. 
That was it. So she did what she could, and she went and gave that testimony, and a lot came from that testimony uh, that she had. So another one, I'm just going to tell most of the story because it gets a little bit longer, but the, the four lepers that you have in 2 Kings chapter 7. And uh, if, if you know the story, uh, the king of Syria came and besieged Samaria. Uh, don't have to get into all that part. Um, you don't want to right, right now. But the deal was, and there was a great famine, and people were starving to death in Israel, in, the, in, that, in that part of Israel. And there were four lepers. They had to be outside of the city. They were at the gate of the entrance to the city. And they were considering what they're going to do because nobody had any food there except for uh, the Syrians, which were besieging uh, Samaria. So they thought to themselves, well, if we go into the city, there's no food, and we're just going to end up dying there. Or we can just sit here where we are, and we'll end up dying here too. So why not let's go to uh, the hosts of Syria and see if, if the, by, by mercy they'll get some food from them. So they went to do so, they went to the camp, and when they got there, all the stuff that they had was there, but the people were gone because God had caused them to hear a noise of approaching chariots, and they fled and left all their stuff there. So, so Israel's going through that drought or that famine, I should say, and God made a way for there to be food there. So these four lepers, by the way, you know, lepers, they're separated from society physically, and they're separated from society in a religious way as well, too. They were shunned in just about every way you can think of, and they were also at the bottom. They were literally outcasts. A lot of times we use that term figuratively, but I mean it literally, they were outcast. They were cast out of the normal city and they lived outside the gate. And they found food there, they found gold and silver and they started hoarding. And they, they grab all they could, they take it and they come back for a second trip to get more stuff. And while they're getting all this stuff, they thought to themselves, what we're doing isn't right. So let me read you this in, in 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 9. Then said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. So they did. They went, they went to the porter of the king, and, and then the porter told the king, and he sent people out to check it out, and it was just like, like the leper said. Everything was abandoned. They had food. And that part of the land was saved from the famine. And then they had an abundance of, of, uh, of food there when there was a famine. God used, now I don't know, I don't know how God was speaking to them. I wonder this in many parts of scripture that I read. I wonder what way did God lead that person to do that? What way did, did he, you know, how did he do it? What was he saying? Was it however it was, I don't know. But I wonder, was, was the Holy Spirit, even then, working with those others? I don't know. I can't work with words in the Bible and all that. But they said one to another, we do not well. They, they had some conviction of some sort going on there. And it was part of God's plan because uh, Elisha had already prophesied what was going to happen. And it came to pass. And God used these four people who couldn't have done in any other way that we can probably think of, couldn't have done anything for society. But yet God was able to use them. So again, I'm just reminding you that I'm kind of talking about the little guy in, in, in this sermon, that there's things that the little guy or the little woman can do for service for the Lord. So that's point number one. Point number two is what do you do when you don't have when you don't know what to say? Well, just say what you know. Well, what if you don't know very much? Still, say what you know. You don't have to make things up. If you don't know much, then just talk about what you know and admit the things that you don't know. 
If you're witnessing or telling somebody about Christ and they ask you a question and you don't know the answer, well, then you just, I don't know that. And you can tell them about this part, I do know. And you can just tell them about that. That part you know just might be, this is how my life was before Jesus came into my life. And this is how my life is now that Jesus is coming to my life. You don't have to talk about big lightning bolts creaking across the sky or whatever. If that's not your story, if that is what happened to you when you got saved, well, then tell about the lightning bolts that struck across the sky. But if not, you just say what you know, and you don't make up things. So the, the story here is about a blind man who was blind from birth that Jesus healed on a Sabbath day. And when the Pharisees found out, they were out to get Jesus. So instead of rejoicing that a man who was blind from birth has received his sight, instead they were saying, that sinner healed on the Sabbath day. And they were out to get Jesus. So they called the, the blind, blind man, the, the man who was blind, in to interrogate him. And they asked him a bunch of questions. And he told them that how you know that how he had received a sight from Jesus. He made clay and, and he opened his eyes. And they didn't believe him. So they they sent him out and they called for his parents. And they start questioning his parents. And they were asking, is it true about him being, you know, blind? And they said he we know that he was uh, blind from birth, and that's about all they knew. And anything else you can ask him because he's of age. So they sent the parents out, and they called the blind man back in, and they started interrogating him again. And then let me read you just a couple of verses from John chapter 9. I'm going to read verse 24 and 25. Then again called in the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner, accusing Jesus of being a sinner. In verse 25, And he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. So they were trying to ask him questions about whether, he, he didn't really even know the man that healed him because he was blind. And he put clay on him and he had to go wash his eyes and everything. So he didn't even know what was going on. The only thing he knew was he was blind, but now he can see. And that was the message he gave. And then later on, Jesus spoke to him and he let him know who that who the Lord really is. And it was Jesus that was speaking to him at that time. But the man only said what he knew. He didn't know very much at all. We, we know a whole lot more about scripture than that blind man did. All that blind man could say was, I was blind, but now I see. So whether you're a Christian for 30 years or a Christian for three weeks, you have a testimony, and all you really know is what you know. And that's what you can tell. So when you don't have much to say, just say what you know. So another one is give what you can. And you know, the, and I'm not here to preach on tithing, but I'm gonna to touch on it real quick so we can move on. So I believe we're instructed to tithe. And, in the, and you might say that's Old Testament law. Well, it was Old Testament law for the nation of Israel to tithe and not their surrounding cities and you know, people from different countries and stuff like that. But a couple things that I'll say and then I'll move on and it could be a topic of another time. If you look at the Proverbs, Proverbs tell you precepts or principles, things the way we should live our life. And when you do those precepts and those principles of God, life is better for you. It doesn't always work out because there's a lot of things that go on in the world. But those are the precepts, just like we instructor kids. Teach a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from that. When you do those things, you have a much better chance of your child to grow up to be in the right direction, and, he has a, and that child has a better chance of living a good life. But it does not necessarily mean that that's going to happen because that child has the ability to choose what to do. They have, they have a will just like we do. But 
The right way to do it is you teach, you teach them, train them up in the way that they should go from an early, early age, and they have a better, much better chance of becoming that productive adult when they get to, uh, get to age. But, but they still have their self-will. So one of the precepts from Proverbs is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with thy first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Now that's the precept. It worked in my life, and, and, and I don't think you should just look at one person's life and say, okay, that's the pattern for everybody else, unless that person is Jesus. But God's precepts, God's principles work, and they've worked in, in my life. I remember when we first started tithing, well, we were we had debt. We had credit card debt. We had, you know, we were, it was more of a struggle to get by. And, and we started tithing during that time. And, and I'm not trying to say that this is the way it's going to go for everybody, but not long after that, I got a better job. And still had debt to pay off for a while. Kept tithing. And now it's been years since I've had any debt. It's, you know, and it's not nothing magic. It, it's just doing God's precepts. And there's a much better chance of things being uh, successful. So I believe it is God's directive for us to tithe. And then another uh, part here, and then, I, and then I'm going to move on from this. In uh, Luke chapter 11, 42, it says, But woe unto you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done, speaking of, uh, of the tithing part, and not leave out the other undone, which is not to pass over judgment and the love of God part. But he basically commended the Pharisees there for their tithing part, but he also reprimanded them about the part of leaving out the love of God. So I believe it's, it's, it is a directive for us to tithe, and, not, and you might say, well, I don't believe we fall under that where we have to with and don't. That's between you and God to do. And then I'll read you another verse. It's not about tithing. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Every man according as he has purposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. So my more experience has been, if you're trying to find a loophole out of doing the directive that God really wants us to do, even if it's nothing more than a precept, which I believe it is more, but even if it was nothing more than a precept and you're trying to find a loophole out of that precept, then you're probably not the kind that's going to be giving out of purpose in your heart in the first place. It, it just seems like most people that tithe go above the giving of their tithes because it's coming out of the heart really anyway. So, all that being said, the example I give you of the little person giving, you would think, of all people, how can this person be giving? If there's anybody here that's in need, it would be this person, and that's the, the poor widow that gave the two mites. And let me read you this from uh, Mark chapter 12, and I'm going to read you uh, three verses. And there came a certain widow, and she threw in two mites, which make it a farthing. And he called unto his disciples, as Jesus called unto his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which has cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in, in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So, what do you do when you don't have a lot to give? Simply give what you can. And now, again, I'm not here to judge you. That's between you and God, what that reasonable thing is to do. We're, I think we're, we're blessed with the ability to give when we can. And we can give to things, whether it's, it could be missions, it could, could be to the poor, it could be your time. It could be a lot of different things. 
But it's a blessing to be in a position where you can give. So you think, well, I don't have much to give. Well, then you give what you can. And now what is that? Well, you're raising that up with God. Last point. This, these are going pretty quick, right? And this is the one that I didn't know fit in here or not. Because it's, the sermon was, what could little me do for such a big God? And we start talking about different things and ways you can uh, serve God. We talked about in Romans chapter 12 about your reasonable service and what that reasonable service is. That's between you and God to figure out what that reasonable service is. And you can use the gifts that God gave you to do that reasonable ser uh, service to the Lord. And then we talked about what do you say when you don't, when you don't know a lot? Well, you say what you know. And you stick with what really happened, and you give your testimony. And, you, and if you're asked questions you don't know, you, you just say, I don't know. And you, and you say what you do know. And then we talk about giving. What do you do when, when you don't have a lot? Well, you give what you can. Whatever that reasonable amount is, you work that out with God. The last one I put here was, what do you do when you're overwhelmed? Sometimes you can bring honor to God by simply hiding in the rock. And God can show his greatness to the world just by us being still. So turn with me. We haven't turned it over yet. So here we go. The, uh, the Psalms 46. And we're going to read Psalms 46. We've got 11 verses, and then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Psalms 46. And again, this is in the perspective, think of it as for the little person, the little guy, the little woman. And I don't mean in stature, I'm talking about in, in the world. Verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, Will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. So let's let's think about that a little bit. And those are some incredible things that he te talks about right there. The earth be removed, or the mountains be cast into the sea. All these things happen. There's nothing you can do about that. You know what I'm saying? There's times that we can do what we can do. And then there's times when we just need to hide in the rock. And that rock being Jesus. So in verse 4, there's a river, the streams whereof shall make glad, the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The heat enraged, the king is removed, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh the wars to cease, the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow, and he cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalt, exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. You know, that kind of means think about this. And let's think about that a little bit. And what we read right there is when we come into the position, where, when, when, we, when we come across the time, when we're overwhelmed, when there's things bigger than us, Things that we cannot accomplish or cannot save ourselves from. When we be still and let God move, let God work in your life, God is exalted in this world. And people see that and glory goes to God, which I believe is a way to serve God or, or for sure honor God with their lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the God that you are, Lord. And as little as we might seem sometimes, 
you're a big guy. When times get rough, Lord, we can just get next to you, Lord, and we can hide ourselves in the rock of our salvation. Lord, help us, Lord, go, Lord, to, to use the gifts that you give us, Lord, in service to you, in honor to you, Lord, and help us, Lord, to, to love you the way that we should with all that we have. And help us, Lord, to love our neighbors the way that we should, Lord, like we love ourselves. And Lord, help us, Lord, to be the servants that we should be. And Lord, I pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Stay with me. Peace and understanding and passion of the Father. And be with us as we go on this evening. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.